Hello, today we're going to be doing the 5.2 notes for geometry about perpendicular bisectors. So we have two objectives. One, we'll be able to use perpendicular bisectors to solve problems. And two, we'll be able to use the perpendicular bisector theorem. So um, the word perpendicular, this is the first couple one of these are reminders. The word perpendicular, if two lines are perpendicular, then they connect to form or to create four right angles. So remember right angles are 90 degrees. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to put that on the outside. So 90 degrees for right angles. So that means all four of these angles, so even the ones that the box is not drawn on, those are also 90 degree angles. If you were to draw them all, it just kind of looks like one big box. Um, so normally there's just one box drawn, but you can draw more if you need to. Um, but all four of those are 90 degrees. All right, and then we have a segment bisector, which divides a segment into two congruent segments. So therefore CD bisects AB. So CD is the one doing the bisecting, which means we have this part of the segment and then this part of the segment. And they're both congruent because it is a bisector into two congruent parts. So therefore, AM would be congruent to MB. All right, now if we take both of these definitions, perpendicular and segment bisector, we can get a perpendicular bisector. So if a segment is a perpendicular bisector, then it is perpendicular to the segment and also bisects the segment. So we pretty much took the two definitions that we have known and learned in the past and we were able to apply that to um, this new definition that we have which has both of them intertwined. So CP is the perpendicular bisector of AB. We have these 90 degree angles that we have created and then we also have two congruent smaller segments from our larger segment. All right, so let's go ahead and try out an example. So we have HF is the perpendicular bisector of GE. So HF, we need to really be careful of which one is bisecting which. So HF is bisecting GE, which means these two parts are congruent. And since we have, um, since it's perpendicular, we know that they create 90 degree angles. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw all four. Kinda looks like one big box, but all three, all four of these angles create 90 degree angles. All right, so now knowing that, we can start answering the questions. So first we wanna find X. So I'll go ahead and highlight it. So X is part of that side, which means I want another side. Five is the only other side I know, and it happens to be that they are congruent to one another. I don't wanna pair up a side with an angle. It has to be a side with a side, and they have to be congruent. So in this case they are, we've already proven that um, because they it is being bisected. So I can say that x equals 5. Of course, if we had something like x minus 1, then I would do x minus 1 equals 5. And then I would go and solve x that way. All right, next is y. So we have y here. And that angle is 90 degrees. So I can go ahead and just set it equal to 90 degrees. Divide by 3. And y equals 30. All right, and then our last one, we're finding Z, which is also 90 degrees. So I can just do Z equals 90. And I don't have to do anything again, because once again, it's just a single variable. If I had something like Z plus 10, then of course I would go ahead and solve for Z appropriately. All right, so go ahead and try four, five, and six. So that's a U try. I have mine already filled out, so go ahead and pause the video. Take a moment to try it. All right, so here is the answers for four, five, and six. Go ahead and pause the video again and um, go ahead and try, make sure you have the correct answers, double check your work, and so on. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at seven and eight. Oh, you already saw the U try. 
Uh, seven and eight, we need to fill in the, cre the blanks to create a true statement. So pretty much one segment is a perpendicular bisector of the other segment. Um, the way you want to think about this, since one segment is doing the bisecting, right? So that's usually the biggest, one of the bigger tells um, because we have these extra lines here. Whichever line does not have the extra dashes to show that they are congruent is the one that's doing the bisecting, is the perpendicular line. So CD, so CD here is the one that's being a perpendicular bisector. So we have our 90 degree angle and then the two congruent parts of the larger segment. So CD is the perpendicular bisector of AB. All right, so go ahead and take a chance to try eight. I did accidentally move it into focus a couple times, but go ahead and try eight, take a look at it. Okay, let's go ahead and look at it together. So we have CA is the perpendicular bisector of DB. So we have these perpendicular lines, or not perpendicular lines, um, the two dashes to show that those are congruent. So therefore, that's the line that's being bisected, which is why DB is on the outside and not being done first. All right. So we are at our first exploration. So we want to explore what happens when points are on a perpendicular bisector. So I'm going to go ahead and click the link. Let's see if it loads. All right, so the first one says, click on the box that says points on bisector. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that box. Um, we now have these red dotted lines and blue dotted lines. And it says, move points F and G around on the bisector. What do you notice? So I'm gonna go ahead and move this around. Let's go a little higher, maybe all the way down here, a little bit more. All right, let's go ahead and move around F a little bit. So you should be trying this on your own computer as well. But I'm going to take a video of me just messing around with it. So we're trying to figure out what do we notice. Well, um, I notice that no matter where I move the point on the bisector, the two sides are still the same No, on either side. It's true. All right, and then the third step, it says unclick the box and then click on point not on bisector. So that pretty much means we have a point that doesn't lie directly on this bisector here. It's pretty much, it can go anywhere it wants. And we want to figure out what do we notice. So when we move it around, well, I notice that they're, that they're never equal. It doesn't matter where I put them. I can put it really close to the bisector. Um, they're really close to one another because it's really close to being on the bisector, but really there's not, points that are completely equal. So if I put it here, it's really close. Um, if I were to do that, of course, they are very close to one another, almost the exact same. But the point is that it's if it's not on the bisecting line, not on this middle line here, they're not going to be the same no matter where you move them. All right, so we want to go ahead and make a conjecture about that. Um, when the points are on a perpendicular bisector. So essentially what it creates is an isosceles triangle. And so of course, if you need to pause the video, mess around with the exploration a little bit more, um, if you really need to see how they prove the isosceles triangle. So remember isosceles triangle is at least two sides are congruent to one another. All right, so the perpendicular bisector theorem, if a point is on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it is congruent from the endpoints of the bisected segment. So CD is the bisector here, and D is on that, that line. It says CP, but P is like right in the center. But it goes all the way to D. Um, since D lies on that line, um, that makes this triangle, so we've now created this isosceles triangle here where we have D on the 
perpendicular bisector to have the two um, parts to create the isosceles triangle that are congruent to one another, so AD and DB. Okay, let's go ahead and try a couple examples. So 10 is a U try, so we'll do 9 together. So since we have this perpendicular bisector here, and we know that because of the two dashes to show that they're congruent, and then this 90 degree angle to show that it is perpendicular. So I have these two lines, we have like this triangle shape, right? So I know that these two sides are congruent because K is on my perpendicular bisector. If K was not on the perpendicular bisector, I would not be able to do that. All right, so I can now put 3x equals x plus 10. So I go ahead and subtract x from both sides. 2x equals 10, divide by 2, x equals 5. All right, go ahead and take a second to try number 10. All right, hopefully you paused the video and tried that out. Here is the work for number 10. Once again, we have that same situation where we have this perpendicular bisector. W lies on the perpendicular bisector, so um, WZ and WY are congruent. All right, and our last set of problems for our last example. So given that XZ is the perpendicular bisector, it's right here, I'll go ahead and highlight it. Um, we want to find all these particular parts. So since it's a perpendicular bisector, I know these parts are congruent, and these are 90 degree angles. All right, and then also with that, since Z lies on this perpendicular bisector, I know that ZW and ZY are congruent to one another. So now I can go ahead and start finding my stuff. So I want to find X, so X plus 5 and 3X minus 5. I could set those equal because of the perpendicular bisector. Those two parts are congruent. So 3X minus 5 and then X plus 5. I'll go ahead and subtract X. 2X minus 5 equals 5. Now I have 2x equals 10, divide by 2, and I now have x equals 5. Okay, we'll do the same thing with the y. We have 2y plus 15 and 9y minus 13. Since z is on the perpendicular bisector, I know that these two lines are congruent, so I'm going to go ahead and set them equal to solve for y. All right, subtract 2 from both sides. I get 7y minus 13 equals 15. Add 13 to both sides. I get 7y equals 28. Divide by 7, y equals 4. All right, now we want to find the perimeter of y or wyz. So perimeter is when you add all the sides together. Oops. at all sides. So if we take a look at the triangle, go ahead and highlight it. So it's this whole thing here. Uh, we have a bunch of variables in there. So I'm going to go ahead and just plug it in. So plug in my variables and solve for each one. So I'm going to have 2 times 4 plus 15. So 8 plus 15 will give me 23. Oops. 23. The nice thing, since I know that these two sides are congruent, I know that this one is also 23. So I don't have to do it twice, unless you really want to, to double check. You should get the same answer. If you don't, then you'll probably have to double check the value you got for your variable. But they should be the same because they are congruent. And I can do the same thing with x plus 5. So I'll do 5 plus 5, which is 10. And so that means this one would also be 10. So we have 23 for this side, 23, and then 10 and 10. So I can go ahead and add all those numbers together to find the perimeter. So I have 66 is the perimeter of my triangle. All right, now I want to find the area, so we have the area is one half the base times the height. So the base is here, which we already know is 10 and 10, so therefore is 20 altogether. But we, we are not sure quite what the height is at the moment. 
So the height here, I want to know what that is. I'm going to go ahead and label that H. Since we have a 90 degree angle, I have a right triangle. So we'll go ahead and remind ourselves of how to find a missing side of a right triangle, which is the Pythagorean theorem. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is the hypotenuse. So the hypotenuse is 23. So 23 squared is equal to, and then we have the two sides. So I have h, and if you really want to keep that as a, you can. And then we also have 10. So I'm only looking at this one triangle here. I'm not, I'm looking at half of the larger triangle. So I'm going to go ahead and take h plus the, the bottom, which is 10. And now I can go ahead and solve for h. So I have h squared plus 100 equals 529. Subtract 100, I get 8 squared equals 429. And then I take the square root in order to get rid of the square. And I have h equals 20.71. So it's not a whole number, but I'll go ahead and keep it as that decimal, because I am going to have to plug it in to my area equation. So I now have the area equals one half the base, which is the whole thing, which is 20, times the height, which is 20.71. Go ahead and plug that whole thing into a calculator. We end up with the area equals 207.1. So that last one, we had to do a little extra work and use the Pythagorean theorem, but we were able to get what we needed. All right, and that is the end of 5.2. If you have any questions, please feel free to rewatch the video as many times as needed and ask your que teacher questions if you have any more. All right, have a wonderful day.